Hello and welcome to Coach's Decision, a weekly talk show that covers sports topics from the Bay Area and beyond. My name is Thomas Todd. I am joined here today in the lovely KSCO studios by my co-hosts, Joaquin Nagel and Chad oakland Jolin, who are both suffering from broken jaws right now. I think I'm going to have to do all the talking today. Mumble some responses. Yes. Mumble responses to my questions. I will translate for the listeners. How are you guys doing today? Better than Geno Smith, I'll tell you that. I think everybody's doing better than Geno. Chad? Yeah, doing pretty well. You know, I go back to school in about a week, so that's a bummer. But other than that, you know, join summer. Well, Gino got taken to school pretty hard by one of his teammates. We'll get into that in a second. On today's show, we're going to discuss Gino's newfound love of mashed potatoes and applesauce, a ton of Tom Brady news, and Joaquin and I and Chad will pick our Team USA basketball rosters. I'm really excited about that. Rosturbation is probably the coolest thing in the history of the world. We'll also be taking calls in about 20 minutes and your Twitter questions later in the show. To reach us, call producer Tori at 831-479-1080. Once again, in about 20 minutes, 479-1080. Well, let's kick it off, like we said, with Geno Smith, the quarterback, the incumbent starting quarterback of the Jets, now out six to ten weeks with a broken jaw, punched in the locker room by his teammate. We're going to call him I.K., or IDK, because no one can pronounce his last name. Uh, the man has since been cut and, and claimed by the Bills, so he's off the Jets. But so is Geno Smith for six to ten weeks. Uh, Joaquin, what is your take on this incident? Is this Because uh, Cam Newton just got into a scuffle. It, this is even worse than that, isn't it? My favorite part of this incident is something that you just brushed over in that summary, is the fact that the that the Buffalo Bills have picked IK up. So, I mean, he's a Rex Ryan guy from Rex Ryan's tenure uh, on the Jets. And Rex Ryan clearly has no love for the Jets. So this is, uh, it feels so much like a little jab from Ryan to his former team. Well, and the guy doesn't even have to make the team. Just the fact that he's like, come on, come on over here. We'll we'll take you in. Come on up, say, come up to Buffalo. Even if he's just using him to get back at the Jets and to shove it in their face, I think it's pretty funny. Uh, Chad, what do you think of this incident? I mean, the whole, the Rex Ryan thing, it's just a middle finger. That's all it really seems like from him to the his former employer. But, you know, it's just definitely not, it's the second incident. I don't remember these incidents occurring too much in the past. Seems like this year there's been a lot of locker room on the field incidents. And, you know, this early in training camp, that definitely doesn't bode well for the season. Well, they normally just don't involve quarterbacks. Like, they give them those red jerseys, which means do not touch this man. This man is more important than you. And that was proven when the guy hit him and he got cut. Well, it came out that he, he sucker punched him, right? That's, that's what how, a lot of the reports were that's saying. That's how head coach of the Jets, Todd Bowles, described it. Um, he's in for an interesting season, his first season as an NFL head coach. Described it as a sucker punch, like I said, cut the guy. Um, it's going to be really interesting for the Jets because where do they turn now? It was also a surprise that they were even starting Geno Smith. They're going to turn to Ryan Fitzpatrick who I don't know what you guys feel about Ryan Fitzpatrick. I have some mixed thoughts. I have some good and some bad. Where where do the Jets go from here? Is this better for their team in the long run, the short run, the medium well, run? What did you think of their outlook for this season, Thomas? I thought it was a pretty poor outlook with a, a in a division with the Patriots, who are clearly better, the Dolphins, who are probably better. Um, but I think they'll actually be better with Ryan Fitzpatrick than with Geno Smith. Does anyone agree with me? Well, the the thing that I think with that is, you could say that you might be better, but at least Geno Smith, he could leave you on an upward trajectory. You know, if you go 6-10 and 10 with Ryan Fitzpatrick, you know, you're still in the same spot because he's going to be the exact same quarterback. You've done nothing. But let me give you some Ryan Fitzpatrick. So he's the only non-rookie quarterback on the roster that's not Geno Smith. They have Bryce Petty, Jake Heaps, these guys. No one, no one knows what they can do yet. Clipboard Warriors. Clipboard Warriors. Ryan Fitzpatrick, the last two seasons, has a QBR of 55, which is not horrific. It's not good. He started 21 games with the Titans and the Texans and went 9-12. and 12. That's not too bad considering how horrible the Titans were and how kind of okay the Texans were. But if you're the Jets, do you want to be not too bad? Don't you either want to be in the playoffs or terrible? I understand about the upward trajectory thing, and Geno will come back. That's why they decided to start him because you take a chance, you make the upside play, and you try to make the playoffs. But... I think they're going to have a better record with Ryan Fitzpatrick than they would with Geno Smith. Ryan Fitzpatrick, last season in Houston, 17 touchdowns, 8 interceptions. Geno has yet to have a season where he's thrown more touchdowns and interceptions. Ryan Fitzpatrick understands how to quarterback in the NFL. That's definitely true. But Geno Smith has more, uh, much more upside, right? And what? But aren't the Jets better suited, like better served now to just be bad? 
No, it's not like the NBA. Tanking doesn't really work in Why the not? NFL. Because you you can draft an offensive lineman and in, in, with the top overall pick because the talent is not as dynamic. The teams are much bigger. You know, uh, you can draft a quarterback in the top five and and they're hit or miss and they're not ready right away. Stuff like that. Tanking in the NFL just does not work. It has not ever proven itself. Look, the Houston Texans got Jadeveon Clowney number one has yet to impact their franchise where a guy like J.J. Watt. Uh, a later round draft pick has completely turned it around. Well, uh, we've had this debate before, but J.J. Watt can only do so much from the defensive side of the ball. No, and that's that's true, but sometimes the best available player in a draft is the number one. Like number an, two or, an Orlando pace, for instance. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you're not going to turn a franchise around just by making one draft pick. The only team that's been able to do that recently has been the Indianapolis Colts with Andrew Luck, and that's a once-in-a-generation type talent. So it's more of a, a situational ability to tank. Like, the Colts definitely didn't try that hard to be good that year. Yeah, and also when you're in New York, you cannot tank. I mean, look how the Knicks have been treated by the New York media and the New York fans. Well, look how the Jets are treated by the New York media well, every year. <laughs> that's true. And the Mets and Jets can never be good at the same time, and the Mets are pretty darn good right now. Uh, one last thing I wanted to bring up out of this, and, and Chad, I want your take on this. Lance Briggs, former linebacker for – or is he still playing? I don't think he's still playing. Former linebacker for the Chicago Bears was asked if he ever wanted to punch Jay Cutler. First of all, it's the most loaded question I've ever heard. <laughs> but his answer was a resounding yes, followed by, there were a lot of quarterbacks, but I didn't punch them out of respect. So do you think Geno Smith just never had that kind of respect in the locker room? Do you think he didn't deserve that kind of respect? Why did he get hit and none of these other quarterbacks have ever been hit? I mean, I could see with a maybe a journeyman coming in, a rookie who's, you know, not a rookie, but, you know, first few years as a player, trying to take control. But still, that just seems like the person who hit him, the Ick, however you say that guy's I, last I name. Ick Enkamandi. Yeah. It's, it's, it's impossible. IDK. They're just, hey, there comes a point where it doesn't matter what he said or who's trying to do what. It was just a sour move. So, I mean... Yeah, it's just it's hard to even talk about because, you know, the locker room's supposed to be a good place, especially for players, a sacred place. I, I think the last quarterback to get into a true, like, fist fight scuffle was, um, I'm blanking, Roger Starback in the 70s with the Cowboys. Jim Harbaugh. Harbaugh? In the late 90s. Okay. Got into a fight with Jim Kelly when while Jim Kelly was a broadcaster. Jim Kelly questioned Harbaugh's <laughs> toughness, and Harbaugh took a swing at him and fractured his hand. First of all, Jim Kelly seems to be, like, the nicest guy in the world. Don't ever take a swing at Jim <laughs> Kelly. That's not cool at all. Uh, one more thing, and then we'll close out Geno Smith. Uh, the hefty lefty, Jared Lorenzen. Does anyone know who this guy is? Uh, from Kentucky, right? From Kentucky. Enormous quarterback. When he was in the NFL, he was, like, 6'4", 280, 285. He's now walking around at probably 6'3", 320, because he's sunk a little mm -hmm. into the earth. Playing in the Arena League. Playing in the Arena League. He's thrown his hat. He wants to be the next quarterback of the New York Jets. Publicity stunt, or should they bring him into camp? Isn't everything the Jets do a publicity stunt? Well, he, they didn't even do it. It wasn't even them, so. But why not? Why not? Just bring him in. All right, Joaquin. Bring Has us to around. Lefty forever. Bring us around to the yeah, NBA. Yeah, a little, schedule. a little, yeah, I'm sorry. A little more, a little more, uh, like, yeah, uplifting news, especially closer to home with our champion Warriors. The NBA schedule was released today. And I was just, I, I mean, basketball's my thing. It's what I, like, it's my favorite sport. And so it just got me excited. Warriors are playing on Christmas Day again. Um, and they start the season with five very, very exciting games. They at New Orleans, or New Orleans at home. Uh, so former assistant coach Alvin Gentry will be coaching a the very Pelicans. Very warm, very warm homecoming, I imagine. For yeah, him. and maybe maybe a ceremony. And then at maybe Houston, a ceremony. Then at Houston, then at New Orleans, Memphis, and then back home for Memphis and back home for the Clippers. It's a great opening five. That's going to be a pretty fun run. I had a, a schedule construction question for you. Did they lessen the amount of four games in five days and back-to-backs on this schedule? They reduced the amount of four games in five nights by something around 60%, and they brought down the num like average, amount of, uh, average number of instances of back-to-backs to 17 per team. And the Warriors actually have a league-high 20 of those, but that's partially related to them also having a league-high 25 games on national television. Yeah, there are three teams, I think, that don't have any games on national television. The Cavs and Warriors each have 25. Yes. Do we need to see the same team 25 times? Yeah. Even I'm, if it's our team or LeBron's team, 25? I would, I, I'm always happy to watch a Cavs game. 
I guess. That makes sense. I mean, I, I was looking at the schedule. Warriors-Cavs is a must-see on Christmas Day, of course. It's going to be nice to see the Cavs at full strength with Kevin Love and a, hopefully a healthy Kyrie uh, play against the Warriors team that's still pretty stacked. Uh, the game I looked at early in the season, second day of the season, Spurs-Thunder. I think that's a fascinating game because LaMarcus Aldridge is going to be trying to find his way in the Popovich game, you know, being being – uh, moved around in different ways in the offense with Tim Duncan. Having to play with another big who actually ha- generates offense. Exactly, and Duncan's going to be perfect for him because he didn't get the heck out of his way. But how do, how do the Thunder counter that with just Ibaka and Adams? But that, that's not even important because I want to see Kevin Durant play healthy. Mm-hmm. I want to see Kevin Durant running around, being long, being good, making shots because he's really important to the league. He sells so many shoes. Um, he's such a star. He's the transformative player for a franchise. I really want to see him be healthy, and I think that's the first time we're going to try and get to see it. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, Chad, I have a question for you. You're the cynic in the group. I, I like to say I'm the cynic. Do you think the NBA should play 82 games still? Yeah, I, I think that 82 is a good number for some reason. It seems to be the number that every sport likes to well, play. Because you like hockey, and do you it's, think it works for hockey? Uh, it does. It's a good number of games, especially with sports like Sports, I don't want to say like that, that are more more physically demanding, not like baseball where it's a grind where, you know, playing 160 games makes a little bit more sense. But, yeah, the 82-game schedule, definitely good. But going off what you said, Joaquin, it makes perfect sense. The four games in five nights is ridiculous. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me, especially it might not be a big deal when you're playing in the Atlantic where you have to make an hour flight, two-hour flight. But when you're playing in Golden State, one of those games is in New York, and you have to fly four or five hours to come back home. You know, that's a significant amount of time to lose before a, a game day. So that definitely makes sense. Yeah, the, the four games in five nights that involve that are have West Coast teams traveling east are notoriously difficult. And also, any time a team has to play in Utah or Denver on the back end of a back-to-back, those games those inflate Utah and Denver's home records every year. Because of the elevation. Because of the elevation and the travel. And the often you're changing time zones from the Pacific. They'll play a game in the Pacific, have to leave after the game, and then the, you lose an hour going there. Right. Well, the the city that's the worst, and when you look at MLB travel schedules, Seattle has to travel the most out of anywhere, and there is no more basketball team in Seattle. Well, so Portland's pretty much there. That's a good point. <laughs> but, yeah, if you look at – oh, there's no baseball team in Portland, so that makes sense because I've looked at all the mileage that the MLB teams travel, and the Mariners have to travel thousands of miles more than every other team in the league just because it's so remote and there's no Utah team, there's no Portland team. So that makes sense. All right, that's the top of our show. Let's bust into our first spot. Sponsorship, Ken Keegan, local artist, big fan of his. He's a big fan of ours. He's also a big fan of baseball. We talked about his New York Mets surging in first place right now, looking likely to make the playoffs. I'm actually thinking about going to a Mets game uh, in New York if they do make the playoffs. We'll see how that fleshes itself out. But Ken is a local artist. You can see his art on artwanted.com. Search his name, Ken Keegan, on the site, and you will see dozens of his works Quiet Moon, a very serene painting, very beautiful use of blue and green. Ken is great. That's at artwanted.com. Search Ken Keegan. All right, now we're going to flip it over to some baseball because there's a lot of really interesting things to talk about, especially something that happened today. We're going to go to our friend Daniel Zarchi, our resident baseball expert. Danny and I have been podcasting about the Giants for coming up on five years now. Danny, how's it going, buddy? I'm good, good. How are you doing? Pretty good. So I know that you have a personal connection to the Seattle Mariners because you date <laughs> you date one of their super fans. Um, yeah. How excited is is the future Mrs. Zarchi about Iwakuma's no hitter today against Baltimore? Well, I I went to court today and I was did not look at my phone like a good like a good little boy. And when I came back, I had uh, four or five text messages all in caps. I think that's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, so so she was very happy, um, and Iwakuma is just well. Let me back up. One of my big things this year has been guys who were great and then got hurt, and then everyone counted them out, right? So take Prince Fielder for example. Prince Fielder was one of the best and most reliable players in the league. Basically, has been since he since he started playing every day, and. By every day, I mean every day. He'd play 162 games. He'd always bat over 300. He'd always hit 25 to 35 homers. He was he was an iron man. And then he got hurt, and then he missed a year, 
and then people said, well, this guy's no good anymore. And it, that just never made sense because you can directly point at the injury that caused his poor play. And uh, with his injury in particular, there's no reason to believe that it would still affect him. And so now, you're saying the same thing with Imakuma. He was out for a year with an injury, and he was already a pretty unheralded guy, a very underrated player because of where he played. Right. So Imakuma comes over, uh, is one of one of the five best starting pitchers in the league in 2013. Uh, nobody knows who he is because he's on the Mariners. The Mariners didn't make the playoff. You know, he, I mean, think about if he'd gotten the same amount of attention that like that Ken Tanaka had got. Um, and, I mean, Masahiro Tanaka. Sorry. Ken Tanaka got as little attention as he deserved. Yeah, as he deserved. He played some left field for the Giants. He's long gone now. So, you know, it comes, ac- uh, comes across the, the Pacific Ocean, pitches incredibly well. Nobody knows who he is. Then in 2014, he pitched amazingly well for the first two-thirds of the season, then got hurt and pitched really poorly in the end of the season. And this year, he's been a lot of it hurt. But it's the same deal. He came back, and he's, he's been, you know, up and down so far since coming back from the DL. But there's no reason to believe that he's not going to be the same dominant guy that we thought he would be. Well, so it's pretty crazy, not just that Iwakuma threw a no-hitter, because those are always crazy, but that it's the first no-hitter of the last 12 that have been thrown in the American League. The last one thrown was King Felix in 2012 when he threw his perfect game. Is that just about the pitcher hitting in the ninth spot for two at-bats a game, or what, what is it about that, the National League versus the American League, that there hasn't been one in the AL? Well, if you think about it, I mean, no-hitters are, no-hitters are luck. I mean, obviously they're a product of of a pitcher pitching really, really well. But they're also a product of luck. Um, and if you remove the, removed the DH from the equation two to three times through the lineup, then, you know, that two or three fewer times when the bat of Dragon can, you know, can ruin everything. Okay, well, let's move on. Let's talk some playoff races, and let's get let's get Chad Oakland Jolin in on this because I want to talk about the National League Central because it is so good right now. The St. Louis Cardinals have been the best team in the National League pretty much all season, but right now the Cubs and the Pirates are teams on the up. They're not just coming for St. Louis because who cares about that? They are in control of the wild card right now, and as someone who roots for the Giants, I'm actually starting to think the Giants have a better chance of winning the division then they do a wild card spot, and the numbers are starting to flesh that out. So I'm going to ask Chad first, and then you, Danny. Of the three teams in the NL Central, are those the three best teams in the National League? And if you had to pick one, which one would you go with? Uh, it's hard to look away. I don't. I don't consider the Cubs up there personally. They've been too streaky, been too spotty. But Cardinals and Pirates, they definitely jump out. Maybe not the most talented teams in the league, but p- definitely playing the best. Because, uh, I mean, the Cardinals were some 30 games over 500 at the break. You know, that, that doesn't happen all that much. And, you know, I still wouldn't consider any of them, but the Pirates a real contender. I just, for some reason, the Cardinals, they just don't seem like they have it. And the Pirates, I feel, once they get into the playoffs, get into that series, McCutcheon and that pitching staff, they're going to be... Fine. Them and the Nationals. Those are the teams that jump out at me. The Nationals not playing too good, but they still have that star-studded team. Well, it doesn't look like they're, they're not even in line to make the playoffs right now. The team I guess you could throw in there, Danny, with the NL Central teams would be the Dodgers. Do you think all three NL Central teams are better than L.A.? Uh, I don't think so. I, I, I mean, I agree with what Chad was saying, but in a different way. I do think the Cardinals are the best, the best team in the majors, and I think that our rotation is absolutely deadly. Um, and, you know, they have this amazing ability because they've suffered an amazing number of injuries, but they have this amazing ability to keep calling up guys and those guys performing really well. I mean, they, they took the loss of Adam Wainwright and didn't even seem to flinch. Yeah. And now Matt Holiday and uh, Matt Adams. And, I mean, they just don't need any Matt. <laughs> any, anybody with Matt or Adam in their name, they're fine. <laughs> They haven't really missed any beats. They've missed a lot of players this season. They just keep plugging guys in. Johnny Peralta is playing really well for them. Randall Grichuk is one of the better rookies. Uh, maybe he's going to finish top five in National League Rookie of the Year. Uh, one more team I want to talk about before we let you go is a team that the, the sabermetric community has had their eye on the whole season, and that's the Toronto Blue Jays because their record has not lived up to their run production, their run prevention, but they got a couple of guys, and now they're streaking, and they look pretty likely to win the AL East, which is... 
a pretty bad division this year. Um, do you think the Blue Jays could be ho- hoisting a World Series trophy at the end of this season? I think absolutely. Uh, ever since you know they made the biggest splashes in the trade deadline, they got Charlie Lipsky, who we know is really, really, really good, and they got David Price, who is also. How, how many reallys good. do you need for David Price? <laughs> uh, more more than we have time for on this show. Uh, but I don't, um, ever since they got to Lewinsky in the games that he started, the the Blue Jays are something like 13-0. and 0. And, well, I actually don't know if they won today, but last time I checked, they were winning 11-1 to 1 in the I, second inning. I, I know their bullpen's bad, Danny, but I'm going to go ahead and assume they won that game. <laughs> Joaquin? Oh, hasn't their bullpen actually improved of late? It has improved of late. Mm-hmm. You know what helps it improve? Yeah. Uh, when a guy goes eight innings and gives up two runs like David Price does all the time. So the Blue Jays, but also with Price there, for some reason all the pitchers are doing well. And that might be their, their downfall in the playoffs is, is that they don't really have a, a reliable rotation. But if they can pour eight runs a game, I mean, the Giants aren't going to beat that. Well, uh, well, the Giants aren't going to beat the Cubs right now. So I don't know if we can talk about that too hard. About them actually playing an AL team. The You're not worried I'm about. Not worried about the you haven't worried about the Giants ever. You weren't worried about them in 2009 when they lost like 92 games. You didn't care at all. <laughs> you were hopeful for I a think, bright future, and you were right. I'll give you credit. You were right. I think the Giants beat out either the Cubs or the Dodgers, uh, but not the Pirates. I think I think the Cards and the Pirates are legit. Okay, and and Chad seems to agree with you. Chad, do you think the Cubs are going to drop off? Do you think the Giants make the playoffs? And if you do, do you think it's division or wild card? I think their only way in is the division. And, you know, it's hard to bet on them just because they're so inconsistent, but it's hard not to because it's the same core that's won three championships. Yeah, well, it's... So it's kind of a... Tough situation. It's an odd year, so we're going to say no. I'm going to say no on the Giants making the playoffs this year, though they have a really strong offense, and I think they're going to have a good team going forward. Well, Danny, thank you for coming on the show today, bud. Good luck in your many ventures. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, I look forward to coming back on and talking about Chase Utley. Oh, I can't wait for that, Danny. I can't wait. Even if, it's a pl- even if it's a player worse than Chase Utley, you know we're still going to talk about it. All right, thanks, man. Have a good one. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, that was Daniel Zarchi. We're going to tell you about 99 Bottles on Walnut Street between Pacific and Cedar. 99 Bottles is the premier downtown location for dining and entertainment. Seriously, one of my favorite places to go downtown. Drink selections from domestic to -to hard-to-find beers. Their IPA selection is off the hook. Their bartenders know what's up. They have taps that you can't even see until you order a beer, and then they walk over to a tap you have not even seen. Hundreds of choices to work your way through in their bar. They also have good drinks. uh, Sorry, they also have good food in addition to the drinks. Uh, Waffle fries are a must. Full menu, pub food, sandwiches, everything is delicious. Also, trivia night, Wednesday night's happening right now. If you're not listening right now, please go down and play trivia with Marisa at 99 Bottles. It's a great trivia night. Sports fans can also have a spot at the bar or have a spot upstairs. They have big TVs, small TVs. They will put on whatever local, national, international sporting events you want to watch. All right, gentlemen, we're going to go into a segment we call Calls and Balls. We never get any good calls, but we have lots of good balls. We've had a few calls. I said good calls. (laughs) Uh, you can reach us at 831-479-1080 if you're out there listening. Ask us anything. We're going to start off by busting into what I like to call basketball porn. Oh, are we talking about Team USA, Thomas? We're going to talk about Team USA. Yes. So the Olympics are in 2016, 20, yes, 2016. I don't care when they are. Okay. I want to build up this team I just now. want. I want a Team USA basketball team every summer. Why not? Why not? Uh, right? They need to rest. I think well, they should rest. Well, they, they're having camp. As we speak, and and where? Um, sorry, you you have to tell me. Las Vegas. In Las Vegas. Where, where else are you gonna get NBA always. players to congregate? They're not going to Phoenix, you know. Hey guys, meet us down in Baton Rouge. No, they're going to Vegas. And uh, they're actually having a they're having a televised scrimmage tomorrow, which we will be watching. Which we'll be watching, and their their teams for tomorrow haven't been announced, but the teams for today. Just think about this as a team, like a, just a scrimmage right. team, one half of the scrimmage. I will do that. Carmelo, Bradley Beal, MCW, Mike Connolly, Boogie Cousins, DeMar DeRozan, Rudy Gay, Draymond Green, Blake Griffin, LeBron, DeAndre Jordan, CP3, 
Mason Plumley and Clay Thompson. <laughs> well, it's not Marshall Plumley. I actually think one of those was a uh, defunct wrestling league that you said. I don't even think that was a basketball player. Uh, Mark Michael Carter Williams. Oh, not MCW, w, MCW, not, not, not WCW. WCW. I, I read the notes simultaneously, upside down and right side up. <laughs> Uh, so what we're going to do right now, and, and Chad, feel free, we built rosters, and I want you to tear them down for us so we can get them right. There are 12 spots for this team. We're going to say if everyone commits. Not everyone's going to commit. LeBron James has a big decision to make whether he wants to play or not. Uh, but Paul, we're, we, Paul George is probably on the fence. He's on the fence, but, but LeBron has a roster spot on Coach K's team if he wants it. So we're going to throw him in there. We're going to throw in some other guys who have spots if they want him just to get him out of the way. Uh, Kevin Durant. Yes. Uh, Anthony Davis. Yes. James Harden. Yes. Stephen Curry. Yes. And we're going to throw Russell Westbrook in there, too. So, yeah. So how I, how I see it is uh, from the last – so there's the, the Olympic teams every four years, but there's also the FIBA championship teams. Mm -hmm. And the FIBA championship teams are a little watered down. So just looking at the last Olympic team, there's four guys that are for sure not coming back. Okay. There's Tyson Chandler, okay. Darren Williams, Andre Iguodala, and Kobe. But there are four better guys than that that um, we can put on this yeah, team. So, which is so, so great. Yeah, so that's that's easy, right? And so for sure coming back from that team, KD, LeBron, Westbrook, Harden, the Brow, and I have Chris Paul. Okay, and I actually do too. I have him listed. Uh, at, he's going up. He's in competition with guys like Kyrie Irving, John Wall, Derek Rose. And I, I almost went to Kyrie, and actually Chris Paul looks like he may not come. He's kind of on the fence as well. And Kyrie's not a bad guy to go with because he can do almost anything on the floor. Right, uh, but Chris Paul is more of a pure distributor, unlike Kyrie and Steph, who are kind of hybrid guards where they're score-first point guards. And so I think that Coach Coach K, old-school basketball guy, would at, want at least one pure point on the team uh chad uh chris paul or kyrie i'm gonna have to go chris paul chris paul because of the defense for one it might not be where it was a few years ago but he can still shut down anyone on the perimeter that and just like joaquin was saying you know with all the talent around here you don't really need a point guard that's going to be not stealing shots if you're steph curry but you know taking more shots when you could be distributing to lebron and kd i like chris paul for the talking because you understand his trash talk no matter what language you speak. Because he's jabbing at your shorts. He's moving his mouth. He's giving you discerning looks with his eyes. He's working the referees. I think I think Chris Paul is the clear choice. So then uh, the other call-up I have besides Steph from the 2014 guys, 2014 team, guys who are on the 14 team and not the 12 team, is Boogie Cousins. I think Boogie is a lock. I think Boogie is a lock, too. You don't need too many traditional centers or, or bigs in international basketball. But behind Anthony Davis, when he comes off the floor, it, you barely take a step down bringing Boogie in just because he's so big and he's so talented. And when he wants to run, he can run. When he wants to play defense, he can play defense. And just thinking back to, thinking back to the 2012 Olympics, when the U.S. came up against Spain and the Gasol brothers, LeBron had to spend a lot of time guarding one of the Gasols. There was, a, there was an issue where, uh, where because Kevin Love had fallen out of favor with Coach K, the, the LeBron was pretty much playing as a big with Tyson Chandler. Well, see, you said Kevin Love fell out with Coach K. I actually want Kevin Love on this upcoming team. I have him, I have him on the bubble. I'm not sure I want him on the team. Okay, I, I like him in international play because he's a great rebounder, and he can spread the floor. He can shoot in the corners. He can shoot at the top arcs. I, just, I, think, he, I think he replicates what Carmelo Anthony does, and I don't think he does it as well and in oh, international basketball. Do you want basketball. Carmelo on the I team? Per, I would take Melo over k oh, I don't, the team. I don't have Carmelo on the team. So Chad, here, Chad, you're shaking your head. Yeah, first. no, I don't. It's, Melo's time's done. I don't think Melo's See, coming back. Melo and, Mello and LeBron are the same age. Mello, it's not that Melo's done age-wise. I think he's just done. I don't know. I don't think so. I think if he comes back healthy this year, he's the most prolific international scorer that the U.S. has. And so so my bubble guys are Caleb, Kyrie, Melo, Clay Thompson, John Wall, Kawhi, Blake Griffin, and Paul George. Okay, so do you have so Clay on I the take, team? Because I have actually a guy I'd rather have than Clay Thompson. So No, I don't, I don't have Clay. My okay. my. I have Mello, Kawhi, Gr Blake Griffin, and Kyrie making it from the bubble. Okay. See, I agree with Blake Griffin and Kawhi Leonard. Kawhi Leonard because you can just send that guy out on the floor. Don't even ask him to guard anybody. Just harass everybody. You can send out Kawhi with uh, LeBron and KD and have the, mo the, the most like 
scariest length on any and team. And then you can and throw also, Curry look, and Harden on the floor. They don't have to could, guard anybody. Or you could have Harden and Anthony Davis as your other two guys, and yeah. everyone is huge. Okay, so I want to go for my guy, my wing that I picked, because, you know, you've got Kawhi, you've got the Blakes of the world, you've got Durant on the wing. I like Jimmy Butler. You do? I, I think Jimmy Butler would be fantastic in international play because of his defense. All, all these guys can score. When James Harden and Steph Curry are on the floor, why do you need scoring? No, See, you, I, would, I would take Kawhi over, or, uh, sorry, I would take Clay over Butler. You would? I would. Hmm. I would. I think, he, I think he's more effective as a floor spacer, and he pretty much replicates the defense. And if you already have stoppers like Kawhi and LeBron, I don't know that you need that from Butler. Uh, Chad, any love for Dwight Howard making this team? Yeah, you know, I had him down as like a bubble guy, maybe him with that kind of slosh DeAndre Jordan because they would bring pretty much the same thing, bad free throw shooting and good defense. But, you know, when you have Anthony Davis and Boogie Cousins, it doesn't really seem like you need him. And Dwight Howard, you know, uh, I just don't like the man, so I would not put him on the squad. What do you think, Joaquin? <laughs> Uh, I don't think there's any room for Dwight Howard. I think okay. his I think his body can't hold up playing a full year. I think he needs time off in the summer. So wait, who is your other big then? Lamarcus? Hall? Oh, Carmelo. You liked Carm- Carmelo. I what like about, Carmelo. What about Manimal? What about Fareed? I think Fareed's an incredibly useful player and would have been great when all the stars didn't want to play. He was he was on the 2014 team exactly. and they he needed well. that energy player. But I don't think I don't think the team with the, this much talent needs an energy player. I completely agree. I completely LeBron is an energy player. You know, he doesn't get praised for it because he's the best basketball player on the planet, but he brings energy every time he's on the floor. I mean, look look at what happened in the finals. They didn't have an energy guy that wasn't Della Vadova. It was LeBron. So. All right. So I so the only place where we differ is I have Melo where you have Jimmy Butler. I have Kevin Love, too. Oh, Kevin Love. There I have Kevin go. Love over Carmelo, and I have Jimmy Butler over... Who did you pick instead of Clay for your wing? Kyrie. Kyrie. I don't have Kyrie on my team. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong, but is John Wall not on this list? John Wall's not on this list as at camp this year. I have him as a bubble guy, mm-hmm. and same with Paul George. If Paul George decides to play, I think he can take a spot away from either Melo or Kyrie. Both but fantastic I don't, players. I don't think John Wall shoots the jumper well enough to be effective internationally, especially with other high-usage players on the floor. Totally agree. What do you think, Chad? Do you like John Wall? I mean, yeah, he brings a lot of energy. He's just quick, and he can score on the inside, but that's not going to translate as well to international game. Yeah, we saw Derrick Rose struggle in 2014, oh. and so I don't think I don't think that that experiment continues with John Wall. This segment's giving me goosebumps. I think this is the most fun we've been able to have like as a team so oh, far. It's I enjoyed great. the crap out of that. All right, uh, I've been enjoying the crap out of the Internet the last few days, and it's been a Tom Brady grab bag. It's been crazy on the Internet. First of all, this sketch comes out from the courtroom. <laughs> the hunchback of Notre Brady. <laughs> and awesome. Tom Brady just looks like his face is melting. He looks like he's a zombie who saw the Ark of the Covenant in Indiana Jones. He's just they caught him apart. halfway after drinking out of the wrong grail cup. Something happened, and I think the artist even had to come out and apologize and say, Tom, you're a very handsome man. I apologize for my shoddy craftsmanship. Maybe maybe his wife is sucking the soul out of him. <laughs> yeah, I don't, he looks fine, but uh, it was... Was great because they put the the zombie Tom Brady face on like Edvard Munch's The Scream and mm. a bunch of Vincent Van Gogh paintings to make him look completely awesome and awful. Uh, they put him in the E.T. basket. They put him on the Hunchback of Notre Dame poster. Yep. That was good. Uh, some other Brady stuff. Sun King Brewing in Indianapolis has imprinted Tom Brady sucks on the bottom of twenty thousand cans of beer. Wow, wow. Okay. How do you ingratiate yourself to Indianapolis fans more than by just crapping all over Tom Brady? I mean, they're just – shouldn't they kind of be happy that he was just crapping on Peyton Manning himself? Oh, that's true, and that's another thing. Uh, Brady's emails came out, and a lot of them have been – not a lot of them, but, but some few, of them. some of them were about Peyton Manning. I've got a, a, a quote here from Brady in his email that says, I've got another seven or eight years. He has two. That's the final chapter. Well – Let's think about this. Tom, how old Tom That's Brady? It's like a RZA lyric. Uh, Tom Brady's what? 38. Tom Brady's old. 30, yeah, 37 at and, least. Yeah. And Manning's 39. Mm-hmm. What sort of NFL are they playing in where Tom Brady thinks he can play till he's 45? I. When's the last time he on? was hurt? I mean, he blew out his knee. Bern, uh, Bernard Carmel Pollard blew out his yeah, knee. Yeah, but he could barely move. Like in three years, you think he'll be able to move around? I mean, I think seven or eight years is an exaggeration. Chad, what's the longest you think Brady can play? 42, 43. Okay. It's just, you know, he's been playing for so long, your body just can't take it after so long. But he's taken so many fewer hits than someone like, say, Brett Favre. Like, yeah, Favre but it's, took a it's lot still more, more years. 
Right, but he, it was a different NFL, and it remains a different NFL, where he can just go out there and keep winging it. As long as his arm stays intact and Belichick doesn't let the line fall apart, he can play forever. And we've seen Manning can't even play into January anymore. But but the thing is, it only takes that one. It takes that one clean hit that ends your career. That's true, too. See, I think I think Manning has two or three left, but I don't see Brady having more than four or five. So, and, and so Tom Tom apologized to Peyton Manning, and Peyton Manning said he sent him a text that was unnecessary. They're professionals. They're the two most professional guys on the planet. Yeah. There's the reason they've been around for so long. Peyton said, the fact his emails got revealed, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah. You know why? Because it didn't make any sense at all to anyone why we should see Tom Brady's private emails and text messages. And I'm glad he destroyed his phone. Wasn't it uh, as part of a suit that the NFL Players Association actually filed in, on his behalf? I, I couldn't tell you why they came out or who requisitioned them or whatever. I just don't like seeing people's stuff. I just like, hate because they're athletes, and I mean, I understand they're in the public eye, but, you know, they have a personal life. It's like, it's just like a celebrity. It's it's just ridiculous. Right, and it's like, when I come off this show, what I say about you two to my friends behind <laughs> your back, I want to stay behind your guys' backs, because I don't want you guys to know. Thomas is always saying, you know that Joaquin, he has about two more shows left. <laughs> me, me, I got seven, seven or eight. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no harm, no foul. I didn't think a lot of it, Joaquin. <laughs> That's good. Okay, uh, this one's a little more dire. This is not as much fun as the Brady grab bag. Our first NHL story I think we've done fully, and it has to be negative. Patrick Kane is being investigated for an incident at his house with a woman who they have confirmed was in her 20s, by the way. I can't believe that was a news story. Confirmed woman was in her 20s that Patrick Kane may or may not have sexually assaulted or, or committed a rape against. Uh, he apparently met a girl at a bar brought her to his house. Later that night, she called her family, checked herself into the hospital, and a rape kit was administered. No charges have been filed, but there have already been consequences. Chad, you're an NHL guy. This is a big thing for the league because that league keeps its nose pretty clean. The players stay out of trouble for the most part to the fact that they've always touted it as part of their league's appeal. How do you think this changes things? I mean, it, it's not just any player. It's the poster boy. Patrick Kane just won an NHL, just won a Stanley Cup, got put on the cover of the video game. Not now anymore. Get, yeah, now he gets it all stripped away, and it's just, it's awful for the NHL. Plus, they had the thing earlier this year with, it was Mike Richards who had the drug charges against him, and that was the first, that was kind of a wow, after every other league being in the negative news so much. And a Aaron Andrews' boyfriend, who's Jared Stoll, Jared mm -hmm. Stoll also had that incident with some drugs. Yeah, and it's... It it really it hurts me in the heart because he's from he's from America he's a U.S. hockey player and it's just you know there's not that many of them that really can get a country to rally behind him like Patrick Kane could. Yeah, he's a two-time Olympian. He's a three-time Stanley Cup champion. He's often said to be one of the two or three best American players in the NHL. But it's a big hit for the NHL specifically because their commissioner Gary Bettman has said. The NHL does not need a thorough and tough program for player conduct off the ice, like he compared them to the NFL, saying our players don't act that way. You know, the direct quote is, I'm not sure if there's any need for any code of contact for our players who, who overwhelmingly conduct themselves magnificently off the ice. We deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. We don't need to formalize anything. Our players know what's right and wrong. We have mechanisms in place to hopefully not get to that point. Well, Gary Bettman, you're at that point right now. One of your stars is, is going to be in a whole heap of trouble. This could go away completely, but they also need to come up with an off-the-ice, thorough punishment for Patrick Kane for even being involved in something and like it this. And like, it seems like when it comes to incidents with Kane, the league has looked the other way in the past also. Yeah, I, I looked up an incident where he, him and his brother beat up a cab driver yeah. over 20 cents. Yeah. I mean, I know they were 21 and 20 at the time and probably morons but like we all still, were. But that that age of being 21 or 20, that's never brought up in the defense of a NFL player. Right. You guys are 22. 23. They beat up a 62-year-old man driving a ta at work. What? It's in, it's indefensible. I can't believe that I'd never heard that story before. As a former cab driver, I find that horribly offensive. I've been punched. I got punched in my taxi, but I'm not a 62-year-old man. So Patrick Kane's in a whole heap of trouble. I'll, I'm waiting to see how this plays yeah, out. Lawyers have already been uh, acquired by both both the accuser and the accused. So like like I said before, no charges have been filed. They're still investigating. But once those uh, charges are filed, he will be suspended. EA has already pulled all of his sponsorships. He will no longer be on the cover with Taves uh, of their 2016 game release. So 
Uh, good luck, Patrick Kane. I hope justice finds you. I hope it absolves you, but I hope if you did it, I hope it finds you. All right. More justice. Tiki Barber wants Roger Goodell to be fired. Yeah. I wow. like it. It's a strong stance. He said he said that he actually had formerly supported the commissioner and that uh, after recent events and after now understanding that the Wells in Wells report and investigation wasn't conducted independently, that he has doubts about whether or not Goodell should continue with the NFL. Chad, what do you think? Should he be fired? Is he doing his job right? I'm I'm confused as to what his job is. Is he doing it right? I'm going to have to go with no. I mean, I don't think any – if you have – I mean, you consider the players as employees, I guess you could very loosely. I mean, it's been a pretty bad year for your employees with all the negative things that have been happening. And, I mean, what has he really done except for say we're going to be better? He hasn't really done much to change it. And then, you know, the whole thing with Tom Brady, not to give the Patriots the scapegoat, but that really – made me sour because of how much he overreacted on that versus the reactions of the domestic violence, of the battery, of all that different, those different allegations that have been fired, filed against his players. <laughs> Freudian slip, I like it, Chad. Yep. But it's hard to say he should be fired because I feel like he's not the one really call. I feel like he's not the one calling the shots. He's kind of the puppet. I feel yeah. like he's just the guy at the face. I think he's really good at being a puppet, which is why he's not going to be fired. It's also why he makes $44 million a year because his bosses are the owners, and no one's calling the owners out on anything. Well, Roger Krauss was always a big Goodell guy, but now he's alienated him. And how many more owners does he have in his pocket? Like how many more – or sorry, in his corner. Like mm-hmm. how many more owners are, is he going to alienate before the owners decide they can't? stand his tomfoolery anymore you need 24 owners to depose a commissioner he has at least uh the owner of baltimore because that guy's stoked that tom brady got suspended (laughs) he's got a couple other of the afc teams that don't like the patriots on his side and honestly there's all these no-name owners of these no-name teams who don't care they don't care suspend my players i don't care they're just making money they're just making money hand over fist so much so that they can give him 40 million dollars a year to look like an idiot and he's doing it so, so well. So do I think he shouldn't be commissioner of the NFL? Yes. But do I think he should be fired by his bosses if I'm his bosses? No way. I'm keeping that guy as long as possible because he can play stupid with the best of them. So. Yeah, as long as, as long as Goodell stays in the news and as long as we're talking about Goodell and not the incidents. And it's not a, the owners. A, and not the owners. It's a win for the owners. Yeah, there's no individual owner who's who's had an incident like Marge shot in baseball in the 90s who said Nazis were good or whatever she did. As long as that stuff Who stays out. was a Nazi. Well, <laughs> that's a whole long story. One more story I want to do with Joaquin to end on a positive note. Elton Brand retired. And I know you and I both have some Elton Brand memories. What a great, great college player. A great college player. Uh, I believe 1999 ACC Player of the Year at Duke. I remember him most for the 2006 run with the Clippers. I remember him most for abandoning Baron Davis after convincing Davis to sign with the Clippers and then going to Philadelphia. Well, he was the ultimate professional. He was the ultimate professional. He actually did, according to my notes, according to my notes, won the Sportsmanship Award in 2006, playing with the Clippers. He led them to their first playoff series win since 1976. So they went 30 years without winning a playoff series. I would say um, a certain dance by a certain alien may have led them to that playoff series. Because okay. Sam Cassell and his celebrations are my one of my favorite memories from the 2000s. Uh, D- Darius Miles might be my favorite basketball player who was really a nobody and a nothing. Over Q Rich? I, I like Darius Miles more. Okay. I just that the headband tap thing was so good by all those guys. All right. Well, we're closing out our show the last few minutes. That means we're going to bring on producer Tori to do some Tori topics. She's going to come on and tell us all the stuff we missed this week. But before she does, we're going to also throw some love towards Ken Keegan, local artist. Go to artwanted.com and search his name, Ken Keegan. We're going to get you back on the show so yeah, on the show soon, Ken, to talk about your Mets. Once again, go to artwanted.com, search Ken Keegan, Room with a View, 2 a.m., The Strawberry Farmer. You can get them printed on T-shirts. You can have them send you prints. All of this wonderful stuff can happen. Victoria, how are you doing? I've got a bone to pick with you, Thomas. Uh Uh-oh. More other than the usual one? I just need to let everyone know that last week, Thomas Todd made me cry. He knows I love the Kings. He knows I love Vladi. And he made me watch Once Brothers. And I spent oh. the last 15, 20 minutes just sobbing like a 
I was sick, so I was 30 for 30 binging, and I finally caught up with uh, the Drazen Petrovic 30 for 30 that Vlade Divac was was central to, and I just knew she loved the Kings so much I had to send it her way. Is it in your top three 30 for 30s from season one? It's really hard not to be. I mean, when Vlade goes to Croatia and people are recognizing him on the street, but nobody wants to talk to him because he's a Serb, and uh, the uh, I don't know, the one guy is like, he's excited just to talk to a human. I mean, he uh, Vlade tries to absolve himself as though he didn't know at all what his actions meant. Well, of course, but that's what we all do about things that happened 20 years ago. Uh, and it was just really sad that they never got to really speak as friends after after the breakup of the Yugoslav Republic. So do you have a top three of season one, 30 for 30s? I will also allow you to consider... No crossover? No. <laughs> well, that's that's in season one. Okay. Um, but you can also take the Bart Catching Hell as okay. part of season one, even I, though it came out a little... I later. like Run, Ricky, Run. Okay. I like No Crossover. And and I like Once Brothers. Those are your three. I think I'm, those are my three. What do you got? I have to go with Winning Time. Oh, I, nope, that's my number one. <laughs> number one time. is Winning Time. Number two, uh, the two Escobars. That one's too too sad. It's so good. It's like number four hundred and seventy three for me because it's too sad. And number three is the U. The U. It's all about the U. Did you see the second one? I have not seen okay. the U part two. I have another chat. Have you seen any of these? U30 oh yeah, no. I thirty for thirty binge the okay. U and the U two. The U two is awesome. It talks about him getting Joshua in a tree. talks about him getting in a fight like right before the NCAA championship game. Yeah, because they oh, still hadn't awesome. found it. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's 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 a good one. All right, Tori, stop crying. <laughs> so many tears. All right, so Clay Thompson posted a video to Instagram today of him making a half court shot while riding a buck uh, while riding a bike. And at the very end, he yells, bucket. I can do two of those things. I can hit a half-court shot, and I can yell, bucket. I cannot ride a bike I very can, well. I can do two of those things. I can receive a pass, <laughs> <laughs> and I can yell, bucket. <laughs> I can ride a bike, and I can yell, bucket. Can't make a half-court I, shot. Yeah, I'm picturing you riding the bike on a hardwood floor and catching a basketball. That would be that would be amazing. I just love the... He catches it one-handed. He doesn't adjust it anywhere. He just... It, Brings it straight to the shooting pocket, flips his wrist. This is why I love young athletes. You know, guys in their 30s, they're just going about their business, thinking about their family, thinking about their... Maybe their doing their taxes. This is just for fun. You know, I just want to ride through a gym on my bike and shoot shoot basketball. You don't think Tim Duncan's doing this in the offseason? No, not at all. His bike is stationary. <laughs> his bike goes nowhere. He's just out there swimming. Yeah, next story. Let's talk about how much I love this rookie class. Oh, I, yes. The, you sent me an SB Nation video of the rookies uh, imitating all of the current players. And you said specifically R.J. Hunter does deli, which is great because all he does is crawl across the floor <laughs> to get the ball, keep crawling like he's in the in World War II in the Military trenches. Military crawl. Time out. Time out. David did an AMA. <laughs> well, that was my next one. The rookies didn't ask me anything on Reddit. The rookies highlights? are great. Uh, Kaminsky's favorite class in college was Vampires in Western, Western Lit. Okay. Uh, he kind of looks like one. Porzingis <laughs> keeps his draft hat in a glass case back home in Latvia with his family. All you have to do is keep it over seven feet off the ground and no one else will be able to touch it. <laughs> Musical guilty pleasures. Sam Decker loves One Direction. Moody. Is that really a guilty pleasure? Sam Decker <laughs> looks like he's in One Direction. Oh, he's adorable. I love him. <laughs> Uh, Moutier. Moutier, Jason Derulo, and Booker, Justin Bieber. What you gonna do with that big fat No Fetty Wap? <laughs> no Fetty Wap. Did oh. you see that uh, they met? Oh, uh, it was great. The Royals met Fetty. Uh, Fetty Wap's the group, right? Fetty Wap is, Fetty Wap is an artist. Trap, it's an artist? Fetty Wap it is an artist. See how much I learn on this show <laughs> that I don't actually apply in my everyday life. Though, you know what? Would I'm you say the Royals are Fetty Wap's trap queens? Yes. I am seeing my own trap queen in two days. Taylor Swift is probably going to perform that song at Levi's two days, and I will be in attendance. You He's, and T-Swift go way back? We go way, way back. Way too like excited this. about this. Wap, wap, wap. <laughs> so I don't even know if that's how the song goes. I don't know anything about it. I just know that means I made a basket. Next story. <laughs> so during Eric Bledsoe's back-to-school charity game... Drew Bledsoe's Boogie, brother, right? Okay, I got this. I got this. Boogie <laughs> scored 91 points on his own. Boogie. By ones or by twos and threes? <laughs> Wait, in what kind of game? It was a charity game for Bledsoe's charity. Okay, you notice there's no D in the word charity, right? <laughs> of course, of that's course. It's like an got, all-star game. Yeah, that's why you got 91 points. There's no D in the... Okay, all right. Boo. Irk, Irk Nowitzki jokes here. Sorry, I'm on a roll. Ace and kid. I'm on... <laughs> 
It's no Jay. <laughs> Not till the end of his career. The first NFL preseason games overnight ratings were higher than the Blackhawks Lightning Stanley Cup clincher. Yeah, why not? Football's back. Duh. <laughs> Football is back. Uh, Somebody had to actually like sexually assault someone to get a hockey topic in this show. That's how sad hockey is. Sorry, Chad. Deal with it, Chad. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> we'll just love hockey and do what we do. It's fine. You sound like mixed martial arts fans. Yeah, who cares about all you guys? We just have. Yeah, our, we know our sports the it's best. Not, it's not a niche sport. It's just the only sport. Okay, I bro. mean, pretty uh, much. Niche. <laughs> Eagles fans want Pope Francis to bless Sam Bradford's knees. Somebody has to. I think he's too much of a communist for that. I don't think he's. I don't think he's looking out for the knees of someone uh, who's Bradford playing in the, the Pope? NFL. The Pope. Oh, the Pope. <laughs> you meant Sam Bradford. No, the, po- like, oh, the Pope is a Jesuit. I was like, Arian Foster came out as atheist. Did Sam Bradford come out as communist? <laughs> no, I think I think the presiding feelings along a lot of people is the Pope's a little farther left leaning than most. Oh, why? Because he cares about the earth. Yes. Okay. <laughs> And, All right. and believes in, you know, freedom of choice. Oh, my goodness. What a man. All right, one more story, then let's close it out. All right, this one's for you, Joaquin. The North American Soccer League Commissioner, Bill Peterson, wants to introduce, introduce pyramid promotion and relegation systems despite the pushback from the MLS. I love it. I love it's, relegation and promotion. We need it. I think, well, I love it in all sports. I wish all sports had relegation You know why I brought Chad on this show, right? I'm sorry. You don't have two shows left, Joaquin. <laughs> you have no shows left. <laughs> Hey, I'm getting three points from tonight, Thomas. <laughs> I'm winning this show. Winning time. Uh-huh. All right, we actually do have time for one more story, Tori. Let's do it. All right. The cutest delay of game ever. Rogue Squirrel stops Royals Tiger game. Now, color of squirrel. Black. Nailed it. Yeah? <laughs> Love black squirrels. Oh, I have one that lives on the roof next to my house. He just stands on top of the roof and eats his nut. My favorite is that uh, in a Liverpool soccer game a couple of years ago, there was a cat on the field, and they didn't stop play. They just had – there was a cat. Like, the ball was on the other half of the field. The, the cat was kind of down by the goal. The Anfield cat, so you know cute. What? The countries these guys grew up in, you know, South America, Africa, there's animals just running all <laughs> just over the place. Fields How would aren't a cat necessary. make it to, like, the pitch on Liverpool, Liverpool Stadium, though? I don't it would know. have to get through so many lines of security. Dude, but cats are, like, the sneakiest. Yeah. They just, it, it just waited ninjas. for the game to start and ninja it around. They're self-sustaining. They can travel long distances. They squeeze into <laughs> They're tiny They're natural holes. predators. They're very quiet. That's true. Maybe it was, it was probably just stalking a mouse and wound up on the pitch. Dogs can't sneak <laughs> in because they're morons. They let you know they're there the first second that they're there. It goes, human, human, human. Yeah. <laughs> but let me I say the you. best part about the delay of game. The commentator said... Teams have tried just about everything to try to get Wade Davis in the eighth inning. This is the first time a team has thrown a squirrel on the field. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, that's our show today. Some thank yous and some glorious self-promotion. You can find all episodes of our show on iTunes by searching the name or YouTube at Coach's Decision. Follow the show on Twitter at Coach's Decision. Follow me on Twitter at Giants Todd. Joaquin at Walk underscore Nagel. Chad, throw out your Twitter feed. At Chad Oakland Jolin. Have fun spelling that last name. Okay, L-I-N-J-O-L-I-N. I think I did it. Yes, you did. All right, well, thank you to producer Tori for all the hard work you do. Thank you to Chris in the other room. We love you, man. Can't do this without any of you. My name is Thomas Todd, and you're listening to KSCO 1080 AM, Santa Cruz, Salinas, Monterey.